Good evening and welcome to tonight's show, A Conversation with Cordelia Harvey, part of a series of Looking for Lincoln Conversations. We are excited to be partnering with the Civil War Museum in Kenosha, Wisconsin on tonight's program. Looking for Lincoln Conversations is a series of live virtual programs featuring a variety of topics surrounding Abraham Lincoln's life and times. For more information about Looking for Lincoln Conversations, please visit our website at lookingforlincoln.org. This program is funded in part by a grant from the Illinois Arts Council Agency. It is now my pleasure to introduce our host, Chris Villillo. Thank you so much, Heather, and welcome to another Lincoln Conversations show. Now, as you watch our program this evening, take a moment to jot down some thoughts or questions that you might have, because at the end of the show, we'll have a Q&A, and you can enter your questions into the chat at any time, and I'll present them to our performer. Now, at the height of the Civil War, Union soldiers were dying at a staggering rate, often from a lack of proper care. In an era when sanitation was unknown and infection was misunderstood, it would be a woman from Wisconsin who would take up the cause. And not just any woman, but the wife of the governor who had lost his own life bringing aid to soldiers. She would become appointed as the state sanitary agent traveling up and down the Mississippi River, bringing aid to Union soldiers everywhere. And she would take her cause all the way to the president of the United States, Abraham Lincoln himself. Her name was Mrs. Cordelia Harvey, and she is joining us this evening to tell us her story. Friends, please welcome Mrs. Cordelia Harvey. Thank you. And good evening. I knew what my duties were as a sanitary agent. I was to see to the welfare of the soldiers, see to it that they were provided with various supplies. I was to inspect the hospitals for cleanliness, see to it that the surgeons were apt in their duties. I was to keep my husband's successor, Governor Salomon, informed of my work and my whereabouts, and to present him with a list of the names of the sick, the wounded, and the dead. But I was completely unprepared for what awaited me at Cape Dorado, Missouri. There are times and the meaning of words seems to fade away. So completely does our language fail to express the reality. I was never so keenly aware of this as when trying to depict the suffering that I witnessed, both physical and mental. To lie extended upon a narrow cot day by day, slowly perishing from disease, surrounded by the dead and dying, far from friends and home, with no hope of seeing either again on earth, with every sensibility tortured by sight and sound requires more courage, greater power of endurance and firmness of purpose to meet and bear uncomplainingly than to meet the armed foe even in the heat and excitement of battle. At Cape Girardeau, the sick and wounded were being brought in from the swamps by the returning regiments and upriver on boats to makeshift hospitals, mere sheds filled with cots side by side so close one could scarcely pass between them. There were a hundred men there, suffering from every disease that flesh is heir to, pneumonia, typhoid, and camp fever, and that fearful scourge of the southern swamps and rivers, chronic diarrhea, occupied every bed. The surgeon said, there is nothing else here. There I see pneumonia, and on that caught fever, and on that caught another disease, and I see nothing else. You had best stay away. The air is full of contagion, and contagion and sympathy go not well together. Their only nurses were the convalescent patients who went pale and tottering through the rooms, doing, it is true, all that they could, but sometimes they would just get sick again. There was one surgeon there, one surgeon for the entire regiment. The first assistant had gone home, and the second assistant was himself sick. As I passed through these hot, uncomfortable, unventilated, infected, wretched, unclean rooms. A hand reached out and clutched my dress. Another caught my shawl and kissed it. One soldier placed my hand to his fevered cheek. Another cried out in wild delirium, I want to go home. 
I want to go home. Lady, lady, take me away in your chariot. Take me away. Grown men cried like children. Some of them were only boys. Oh, my mother, they would say, my mother. Can I go home, Mrs. Harvey? On these cots, I failed to see disease and delirium and looming death. I saw the sons and brothers, husbands and fathers of anxious weeping ones at home. And as such, I cared for them, both the living and the dead. Upon my arrival, I found that the body of a dead soldier had lain for hours unattended to because those in charge were afraid to touch him because he had died of disease. But I could not be afraid. This was some mother's son. So I asked for some bandages. And with my own hands, I bound up his face. And encouraged by this, the burial party coffined the body and removed it from that place. At Cape Girardeau and at every camp and hospital that I visited, I, pardon me, I, I must consult my notes. I have not had to speak to a group such as this in some time. It was part of my position to find our Wisconsin soldiers and to make a record of each man, his name, commanding officer, company and regiment, and his condition, so that if he were no longer fit for service, he might receive a certificate of disability. This would allow him to gain a furlough or a discharge so that he could go home. At Cape Girardeau, I requested certificates of disability from the surgeon there for a number of the men. These were deemed imperfect by the medical authorities at St. Louis and returned to us so that the surgeon had to make out new papers before these men could have leave to go home. As I feared, many of these men, while awaiting these papers, received their final discharge from all earthly service. Time and again, the papers that were needed for furloughs and discharges were disapproved by the medical directors and returned to us. The surgeon in charge of the hospital at Helena told me that he had, a number of times, made out certificates of disability for some of the men in his hospital and sent them to the medical director, a young major in the regular army, who invariably disapproved them. The surgeon said that he had even allowed some of the men to travel to present their papers in person, only to have this young major reject their requests, castigate the poor soldiers soundly, and order them back. The surgeon said with tears in his eyes that many of these men never returned, for, brokenhearted, they had lain down by the side of the road and died. And if you think this impossible, you must know that I have found men who have lain on the same cot for five months. They are too sick to fight, but the army will not let them go home, and they are not being paid the entire time. Who would not lose heart? It was my original intention to care only for Wisconsin soldiers, but I soon found that in order to help them, I had to do for as many as possible. In the hospital at Helena, there were between 14 and 1,500 patients. I lay awake all one night asking myself, could I visit them all? But I decided that this was the best way to help our Wisconsin soldiers, and so I would do it. Our boys in blue are all alike dear to me. God bless them all. No one state can claim them exclusively, but they are the pride of everyone. States' rights are not recognized any more by sanitary agents than they are by the government. The medical inspector, of General Grant's army, a Colonel Allen, said that if I would go through the entire hospital and make a list, the name, company, and regiment of every man that I deemed would never again be fit for service, of course, I could not judge of disease, that he would act upon these cases at once. There was no one else to do this. I only took the names of cripples, consumptives, feeble old men over 60 years, and boys between the ages of 15 and 18. I do not remember the exact number, but they were hundreds. It took three long days of hard work from early morning until late at night. And by the time I was finished, I was very well acquainted with the surgeons, the medical inspector, 
and the medical director. In fact, I stayed there for 10 days doing whatever work my hands could find to do. I also visited camps and hospitals at Memphis, Corinth, Jackson, LaGrange, and at Vicksburg, I met with General Grant, who received me with all possible attention. In fact, we spoke twice. In this way, I was able to secure from him an order stating that all those suffering from chronic diarrhea should be sent to northern hospitals. He also approved a plan for emptying the uh, convalescent camps by immediately discharging all those who would never again be fit for service. Now, I put this plan to the test immediately at Memphis, where I found 100 men in a convalescent camp at Fort Pickering. These men could not have lived if they were not sent north. They were not only sick, but needy, as they had not been paid. I was able to secure transport for them at no expense and a clean change of clothing from the Western Sanitary Commission. I deemed the experiment a success for, of all the men released from that camp, only seven died. Five were discharged and all the rest returned to service. I had long felt through much of my work that we must change the medical regulation which required sick soldiers to stay in southern hospitals when, by bringing them north, our bracing atmosphere might restore them to health. I knew that the medical authorities opposed the idea of hospitals in the north, and I could not understand why. It made perfect sense to me. I approached our Senator Howe, proposing a petition for the establishment of hospitals in Wisconsin for our own soldiers. In short order, we had over 8,000 signatures. It was further proposed that I should take the petition to Washington myself, for it was felt that by sending it first by this officer and then by another, that the message would grow cold and lose the flavor of truth before reaching the deciding power. Whenever you have some object to gain, it is always best to go at once to the highest authority in temporal as in spiritual matters. Be your own petitioner. Officiate at your own altar. Be your own priest. And so I went to Washington and entered the White House to meet with President Lincoln, not filled with fear and trembling, but fully conscious of the righteousness of my mission. When I first saw the president, he was seated, his head bowed, his chin resting on his breast, and in his hand was a letter which I had just sent in. He looked up and said, Mrs. Harvey, and I hastened forward and said, yes, and I am very glad to see you, Mr. President. So much for Republican presentation and ceremony. He took my hand and hoped that I was well, but there was no smile of welcome upon his face. It was rather the stern look of the judge who had decided against me. I found his face peculiar. Bone, muscle, nerve, vein, all so plainly seen, with deep lines of care and thought around his mouth and eye. The word justice came into my mind, as though I could read it there upon his face. I mean the extended sense of the word which comprehends the practice of every virtue which reason prescribes and society should expect. The debt that we owe to God, to man, to ourselves, when paid, is but a simple act of justice, a duty performed. This attribute seemed to be the source of Mr. Lincoln's strength. When he had finished reading my letter, he looked up at me with a great deal of sad severity and said, Madam, this notion of northern hospitals has been talked of a great deal, and I thought the matter settled. Obviously not. What do you have to say about it? Only this, Mr. President, that many of our soldiers now in the South must have northern air or die. There are thousands of graves all along our southern rivers and in the swamps for which the government is responsible ignorantly, undoubtedly. But this ignorance must not be allowed to continue. 
if you will permit these men to come north, you will have ten men where you have one now. And he said, yes, yes, I understand you, but if they are permitted to go north, they will desert. Where is the difference? And I said, dead men cannot fight, and they may not desert. And so the argument ran on, I defending my position, the president attacking it, until finally we both realized that we had reached a deadlock, and he handed my letter back to me and suggested that I should go speak to the Secretary of War. Now, as I was making my way to the War Department, I found these words written on the back of my letter. It said, admit Mrs. Harvey at once. Listen to what she says. She is a lady of intelligence and talks sense. A. Lincoln. I was not displeased with this introduction. And so I made my way to see Mr. Stanton, the Secretary of War, who informed me that he had just sent the Surgeon General to New Orleans on a tour of hospital inspection. Well, I knew that this would practically have no effect on the current circumstances. And I said, the fact of the matter is that I became so involved in my thoughts, I forgot what the fact of the matter was. <laughs> Choose a topic, discuss it amongst yourselves. Ah, uh, yes, the medical authorities know that the heads of departments do not want hospitals established so far from army lines, and they report accordingly. I wish this could be overturned. Can nothing be done? Apparently, nothing could be done until the Surgeon General had returned. So I took my leave of him. But I was not at all disappointed with the day's efforts. I felt that I had made a deep impression on both men, and I could afford to wait to see the results of these interviews. I returned to the White House the next morning full of hope, but no smile greeted me. After a moment, the president said, well, with an odd contortion of the face that I had never seen on anyone else. And after a moment, I replied, well, and he looked at me, a little astonished, I fancied, and said, have you nothing more to say? Nothing, Mr. President, until you tell me your decision. You bade me come this morning. Have you decided? No, madam, but I find this notion of northern hospitals to be a great humbug, and I am tired of hearing about it. I regret to add a feather's weight to your already overwhelming care and responsibility I would rather have stayed at home. And with a kind of half smile, he said, I wish you had. Nothing would have given me greater pleasure, Mr. President, but a keen sense of duty to this government and a deep respect for your honor and position made me come. The people cannot understand why their sons and brothers and husbands and fathers are left to die when, with proper care, they might grow strong again and do good service for their country. Many on their cots, faint, sick, and dying, have said, we would gladly do more. I know that the majority of them would be well again if they were permitted to go north. I know because I was sick amongst them myself last spring, surrounded by every comfort, with the best of care, and determined to get well, and yet I grew weaker until my friends took me north where I recovered entirely simply by breathing the northern air. Well, the expression on Mr. Lincoln's face changed many times, though he never took his eyes from me. And then suddenly, every muscle in his face seemed to contract and then suddenly expand, and he said, you assume to know more than I do. I thought the tears would come. But after a moment, I said, please, Pardon me, Mr. President. I do not mean any disrespect, but it is because I do know what you do not know that I come to you. 
If you knew what I know and had not ordered what I asked for, I would know that an appeal to you would be in vain. The question only is whether you believe me or not. If you believe me, you will give me hospitals. If you do not, then you will not. Then he snapped, you assume to know more than the surgeons do. And I said, Mr. President, I come to you from no casual tour of inspection, passing rapidly through the general hospitals with a cigar in my mouth and a rattan in my hand, talking to the surgeon in charge about the price of cotton and abusing our generals for not knowing and performing their duty better, and then finally coming out into the open air and drawing a deep breath as though just having escaped suffocation and complacently saying, well, you seem to have a fine hospital here. The boys seem to be well taken care of. A bit more attention to ventilation is perhaps desirable. It is not thus that I have visited hospitals, but from early morning until late at night, I have visited hospitals all up and down the Mississippi River, from Quincy to Vicksburg, and I come to you from the cots of men who have died, who might have lived had you permitted it. This is very hard to say, but it is nonetheless true. The president scowled at me a bit, though he had not much more to say. I was given to understand that if I would return the next day at noon, I would have my answer. I awoke the next morning depressed, afraid that I had failed in my mission for the soldiers. I was anxious and impatient. I kept looking at my watch, thinking that 12 o'clock would never come. Finally, it did come, and I went to the White House only to be told that the president was in a cabinet meeting. After three long hours, during which I became more and more certain of defeat, the president walked into the room where I had been waiting. He walked towards me, rubbing his hands together and saying, my dear Mrs. Harvey, I am so very sorry to have kept you waiting. I only wish to tell you that an order granting hospitals in your state has been issued for some 24 hours. I could not speak. I was so completely unprepared for it. I wept with joy. <laughs> when I could speak, I said, God bless you. I thank you in the name of thousands who will bless you for this act. And after a moment, he said, I suppose you would have been mad if I had said no. And I said, no, Mr. President, I would not have been angry. To get angry would only weaken my influence and destroy my cause. And he said, well, I think I acted wisely in any case. He said, don't you ever get angry? I know a little lady not very unlike you who gets mad sometimes. And I said, no, Mr. President, I try very hard not to get angry. And then he looked at me directly and said, this hospital I shall name for you. I was deeply touched and very grateful for his consideration. But after a moment, I said, if you would not deem the request indelicate, I would that you would name this hospital for Mr. Harvey. And he said, yes, it shall be so ordered if that is what you prefer. I honored your husband and felt his loss. And then we talked on for a while. And then he looked at me from under his brows and said, you think me almost handsome now, don't you? His face then beamed with such kindness and was lighted by such a pleasant smile that very impulsively I said, you are perfectly lovely to me now, Mr. President. And he blushed and laughed most heartily. As I arose to go, he put out his hand, that hand in which there is so much power and little beauty. And he held mine clasped and covered in his own. A silent prayer went up from my heart. God bless you, Abraham Lincoln. And we said our goodbyes, and I was gone. Thus ended one of the most interesting interviews of my life. Now, though our work is far from over, we have 
three hospitals established in Wisconsin at Madison, Milwaukee, and Prairie du Chien. Our soldiers continue to be tended to by the work of the Western and U.S. Sanitary Commissions and their agents. I say may God bless our dear, brave Wisconsin men and boys, their families, and those who so tirelessly care for them. I thank you. Mrs. Harvey, that is a wonderful story. I first of all wish to thank you for the service you provided, not only the nation in general, but our Union troops specifically. Now, friends, if you are joining us in the live stream, this is the opportunity when you can add your own questions into the chat while I speak with Mrs. Harvey, and I'll ask the questions that you share with us. So go ahead and send those in. Uh, while we are waiting for those to come through, Mrs. Harvey, I'd like to start out by asking you a question myself. I know that you took up this tremendous cause, very unusual for a woman in that age. What was your inspiration, the thing that made you move in the direction that you did? When my husband died, I was deeply grieved. Um, I am not ashamed to say I became somewhat unsettled in my mind for a time. I think my friends became uh, worried about me. Um, and then I remembered how quickly, how soon, how abruptly my husband's work for the soldiers had been cut off. And I decided that I would try to continue his work caring for Wisconsin soldiers and their families. And it helps a person who is grieving to stay busy yes. because they are so uh, preoccupied by the troubles of others that they have little time to think about their own troubles. If I might ask, and forgive me if this is too tender of a subject, Mrs. Harvey, but could you tell us the story of your husband and how he lost his life in the aid of the soldiers? Uh, my husband gathered supplies, uh, clothing, medicine, food. He even induced some of our doctors to join him. He and part of his staff traveled down the Mississippi River. They stopped in Cairo and Mound City, Illinois, Paducah, Kentucky. Um, and they went to Savannah, very near the uh, site of the battle. He visited with the troops, spoke to them, and then he began his return trip on April 19th. And um, he and his party were on one steamboat, and they were to transfer from one steamboat to another. But as the other boat approached, it appeared that the two would collide. My husband instinctively stepped backwards and fell into the water. And uh, even though his companions tried valiantly to rescue him. They could not. The current there is very strong, and he was pulled yes. under, under a flat boat, in fact, um, and was drowned. Fortunately, uh, his body was recovered and sent back to Wisconsin so that we could mourn him properly. I am so deeply sorry for your loss, ma'am. And I know that that had to have been a terrible blow for you. And yet from that tragedy, you went and did what can only be described as great work. Um, was it in any way eased by the fact that you were the widow of the governor, the ability of you to become the sanitary agent and make these incredible strides that you did? There were other women who were drawn in to the work. Um, uh, oh, now my, her name escapes me. Um, she is from Illinois. She uh, currently travels with uh, General Sherman and his troops. Ah, Mary Ann Bickerdyke. Ah, yes. um, she also has done work in the hospitals and such. In my work, I find that when people find out what it is that I do, hotels, 
will allow me to stay at no expense. Trains give me transport at no expense. Um, the word of my, my husband's death, uh, well, as you perhaps know, was in newspapers all over the country. And many um, felt that he had made a great sacrifice. And I could feel their sympathy uh, for me because of that loss. So yes, being the governor's wife, well, I have also been known to be a rather uh, direct, hmm, <laughs> forceful, wanting to get things done sort of person. Um, but whereas I understand uh, Mrs. Bickerdyke uh, says, you will do this, I tend to sit back and observe the person and try to judge how best to address their character. Um, but I'm sure that you have heard that there, I cannot remember if there are other sanitary agents that are women. I think most of them are men. Um, I believe you're I right about that. But I, I um, it did help to get my appointment as a sanitary agent for the state of Wisconsin. That is usual. Usually you are appointed a sanitary agent for the US Commission or the Western Sanitary. Mm -hmm. So that was a bit unusual. And it was because I was going to my husband's successor, I think, that I was able to secure that position. Well, without a doubt, ma'am, your strong personality served you well in the cause. <laughs> Now, we have got some questions coming in from audience members, and the first one asks, is there a specific soldier that had a real personal impact on you, a story you might share with us? There was a young man, 19 years of age, who had enlisted originally in a Minnesota regiment. He deserted. He... Uh, joined a, a different regiment, and again, he deserted. And then he joined a Wisconsin regiment, and he served admirably. And he was wounded and honorably discharged in St. Louis. Unfortunately, he found himself in one of the lowest dens of that city. He was ill, he was robbed, he was left on a dirty mattress. His friends found him and they came to me and asked if I could help. I came to see him. And in his delirium, he called me mother. What was I to do? I told him that I would be back in half an hour. Now, as you know, once someone is discharged for the army, they are not supposed to be allowed into an army hospital. I went to the medical director in St. Louis with whom I already had some dealings. And I said, I know that he is not supposed to go into a military hospital, but he is delirious and he is sick. I need a litter. I need men to carry the litter. I need an ambulance. And I told him I would be back in half an hour. And um, this gentleman, having dealt with me before, um, said, get her an ambulance, get her a litter and men. <laughs> and so he was brought to a hospital where he died, not alone, but in a place of love um, and care. And perhaps his mother will never know what happened to him, but I like to think that it would be of comfort to her that know that to know that he did not die alone on a dirty mattress. But I can but imagine it was a, a great comfort indeed. Um, I'm going to take just a moment to, to glance at a couple of these questions down here from our audience members. 
Um, did you have the opportunity to meet any of the patients that you had helped during the war in the years that followed? Well, the war not yet being over, I cannot speak to that. Um, I am still so busy with it that um, the little time I have to visit Wisconsin, I am speaking to women's groups um, trying to enlist yet more aid. Um, but I have in my mind an idea that there will be many orphans when this war is over. And so I have begun to think that I want to try and work towards getting an orphanage opened um, after the war is over to accommodate those poor children. Um, I'm still too busy to <laughs> hear from soldiers that I have tended to. Of course, your duties continue. Now, we have an audience question here. I, I kind of think I may know the answer to, but I'm going to go ahead and throw this one to you. Uh, one of our audience members asked if you had any training in working uh, with politicians and asking for their help. I assume as the wife of the governor, you probably were quite savvy in the politics of the time. Um, as I said, it seems to be in my nature to size up, as they say, a person and see what is the best way to appeal to their better nature. I will try to give you an example. This was not a politician. It was that medical director at St. Louis. And uh, a woman came to me. Her son was very sick. She wanted to get him out of the army and home. Uh, his uh, papers had already been disapproved by this man. Uh, she begged me to help. I went to see him. Um, he was all of six feet tall, a man over 50 years of age, with a beard like Oliver Cromwell and a face <laughs> as stern as fate. And I sat in his office while he worked away. Occasionally he would toss a comment my way. Finally he said, obviously there's no way to deal with you, but ask you what you want. And so I told him about the mother and the boy with his thin arms clutching her and could he approve the papers? He said, give them to me. So I uh, took the papers out of my pocket and handed them to him and slid them across the desk face down because he had already disapproved them. He looked at them and that is what he said. He said, you know, madam, we have regulations in the military. If I approve these papers now, they will wrap my knuckles in Washington for it. And I said, oh, I wish they were my knuckles. <laughs> because you know what? The skin will heal. And he said, fine, I'll approve the papers, but his commanding officer will not let him go. And I said, but you will have done all that you could and answered to a higher power. <laughs> And that now, is how I dealt with him. And um, politicians are best not spoken of. They are a breed unto themselves, are they not? <laughs> they are indeed, madam. <laughs> now, Mrs. Harvey, I have heard from others that one of the critical things you did with soldiers was to bring them wholesome food. Uh, not just army hardtack and rations, but but fresh fruits uh, and and such. Can you talk about the impact that this had on their health and well-being? Well, first of all, I must give my thanks to the U.S. Sanitary Commission. Mr. Yateman has given me a hundred dollars and said, "Spend it as you will," and I do not need an accounting of it. I trust you. The same thing with the Western Sanitary Commission. They have given me supplies. Um, and I try to see that they are distributed. Um, but this is something that the soldiers need, not only for their bodies, but for their spirits. Because as you know, um, uh, wines are sent, preserves, 
crackers, um, little mm, sweet meats. And I remember one man in particular, he saw me giving such things to the Wisconsin soldiers and he pulled a nickel out from under his mattress and asked that he could have some. Um, and so it was not, excuse me, not only the, um, the health that obviously better food brought, vegetables, fruits, but the help to uh, a sick soldier's spirits, I think was also important. I, I believe you're absolutely right, ma'am. And I also understand that while you went there initially to work with Wisconsin troops, ultimately you were giving aid to Union soldiers from all around the country. In the Western theater, yes. Um, those soldiers um, who were fighting up and down the Mississippi River, of course, uh, we have made our way to New Orleans and I have been there. I have been to New Orleans. Um, and so we have secured that now. Um, and so we have still have men coming on boats on the Mississippi River now that we have these hospitals someplace for them uh, to go north. But most of the soldiers that I have dealt with are in the Western theater. But yes, um, it is nearly impossible to deal only with Wisconsin soldiers when, as I say, another soldier looks on and sees me giving something to a Wisconsin soldier. It breaks my heart if I cannot give them help as well. Um, but I also find, <laughs> here's what happens when you uh, accomplish something. Someone else comes to you and they want you to accomplish something else. And then someone else comes to you and wants you to accomplish something else. And so I have people from uh, states writing to me and saying, I have not heard from my son and he is in this and this regiment and I think they are in this and this place and could you help me find them? Um, yes, I have been called upon for help not only by the soldiers of different states in the hospitals and camps, but I even receive letters from their families. Now, one of the most uh, touching parts of your, your speech this evening was the time that you spent with Abraham Lincoln. And I feel that Mr. Lincoln may have met his match in you, madam. I wonder if you could give us your impressions personally of Mr. Lincoln and your time with him. It is as though I had met six different men. He has in him flexibility and sternness and uh, humor and uh, a directness that very closely borders on unkindness. Um, I have described for you uh, some impressions, but there are so many more. Um, when I first saw him, he was wearing a, a black suit, which did not fit him, but I really don't think one could make for him a suit that looked as though it fitted well. He is very, very tall, and when he stands up, it's more like he's unfolding himself out of a chair. Um, I heard him while I was waiting for one of our meetings and he was talking to someone and countering everything that this man said. And then he launched into a story. And others had told me that when he launches into a story, it means that you're not going to get what you're asking for. Uh, and when he then came to speak to me, I could see he was amused by uh, his victory in the encounter. Um, at another point, he said to me, I shall never be glad anymore with an anguish that was more than mortal. And I tried to reassure him that the soldiers believed in him and that they trusted him. 
and that they would fight for him. But he looked so sad. Many, I have many different impressions of him. Well, I know he carried a tremendous burden, without a doubt. I have another audience question here. One of our audience members wants to know what sorts of things might they send to support our troops in these desperate times? What other forms of aid can they send your way to help you in your work? Well, if the question is from a man, he need only ask his wife because they know <laughs> in many cities there are many women who gather together and have a local soldiers aid society or a local ladies aid society. They scrape lint, they make bandages, they knit socks and gloves, they sew shirts and uniforms and blankets. And then as I say, they grow fruits and vegetables and make uh, all sorts of preserves from those fruits and vegetables. Um, these are the sort of things that especially Oh, they send robes, they send nightgowns, they, um, they send many of the things that a soldier in the hospital needs. Um, so these are the kinds of things that we need. Um, also, money. The U.S. and Western Sanitary Commissions need money so that they can buy supplies and send them then to the various locations the hospital at Memphis and, and the other camps and hospitals. Well, once again, Mrs. Harvey, I want to thank you for your important work serving the nation and our soldiers. But I would also like to shift gears a moment, and I would ask um, that uh, our, our presenter, Mary Kubabic, and forgive me for, for butchering your name, Mary, break character and now address us as the actress who has been portraying Cordelia Harvey. So Mary, uh, congratulations on an outstanding presentation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, your, your conversation with Lincoln, I could see the entire thing happening in my mind. I was wondering, as an actress, how do you go about bringing a historical character like Cordelia Harvey to life? I am fortunate in that now, uh, the man who adapted this script from original sources, um, these sources, for instance, in the uh, Wisconsin Historical Society archives, there are about 40 letters which Cordelia wrote to her husband's successors in the office of governor about her work, as I said, her whereabouts. Uh, names of the sick, the wounded, and, and the dead. So you can go, and I highly recommend, no matter what your field is, these first-hand accounts of not only what she does in the hospitals, but she talks about the things that she witnesses. Um, she speaks of the Fort Pillow Massacre. Um, she says that, uh, now I, I can find the letter right here and read it for you, but from memory, I'm going to say it was a, a, some sort of a merchant who was hung on an adjoining plantation by the officers of a colored regiment, colored as they said then, an African-American regiment, um, for saying that they did right at Fort Pillow. Um, she speaks of, of uh, the, the, as I say, uh, African-American soldiers that she encountered. Mm -hmm. uh, all, all sorts of things that if you are, you think there's nothing that she could have that would speak to your area. I mean, she talks about the generals she gives her opinion of General Sherman. She says that uh, General, no, oh, I can't think of his name right now, pandemic. I haven't had to do this in a long time. But she says, when I send him a request for a discharge, he sends it back right away. Sherman takes three weeks. 
So um, adapting them from these original uh, sources, I read these sources, and I felt such a connection to her. I feel very fortunate in that, in that, uh, you know, sometimes you are given a role and you try to take it on and you're like, what, 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 how do I connect with this person? And I did not have that problem at all, con connecting with Cordelia. She really spoke to my heart. Um, so, and of course, uh, as a trained actress, I would imagine you can simply take those connections and build from that in your inter interpretation. Mm -hmm. I have done a number of um, historical impressions, some of them brief, some of them quite long. I have played Queen Elizabeth I since 1993. And so I'm one of those who, if I'm going to play someone from a different time period, I need to know what life was like in that time period. Yes. And I'm eager. I jump at it reading uh, finding out what I can about everyday life. Um, so that's part of how I build a historical character. Um, because of the time limits, we were unable to do the first part of the show where she talks about how she got where she ended up, you know, meeting her husband and all of that. And uh, much of that I kind of put together from the various sources, and then just tried to talk like I thought a person would sound. Um, so historical, obviously, historical sources and delving into what life was like for that person. Certainly, it would help you put your, your character into the context of the times. Yes. Now, and then. Uh, I, being able to answer questions the way we we did, um, it's always something that, that yeah, I don't know that has appealed to me that um, I want to be able to answer questions, not just do a script, but answer well, questions I, as that person. And I know our audience really enjoys that. As a matter of fact, we have another question that they were asking for Mrs. Harvey. You can answer this question without becoming Mrs. Harvey again, of course. But uh, one of our audience members asked, did Cordelia Harvey ever meet Mary Lincoln? No. Not that no. I have found, not that I have read about. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, she had heard of the kind of person that uh, Mrs. Lincoln was, I think, because um, there's this little inside joke between her and the president when he says, I know a little lady not very, un much, very, not very unlike you gets mad sometimes. Um, but in my research, let's put it this way, in what I have read, I have never heard that she met Mrs. Lincoln. But then again, um, her sphere of travel and influence was in Wisconsin and up and down the Mississippi River. Her family came from New York, and she traveled to New York. And when it was when she went, she was she became ill. Um, after she had recovered, she went and visited family in New York, and that was when she went to Washington to speak with the president. But no, to my knowledge, she had never met Mrs. Lincoln. Well, I'm going to ask just one last question to wind up our session. Let me tell you how much I have enjoyed uh, learning more about Mrs. Harvey through your presentation and, uh, and the way that uh, you have brought this character to life. But as a 21st century woman, what do you think we can learn by studying the, the works of a 19th century woman like Cordelia Harvey? Charity, love, concern for one's fellow human being. And in her particular case, how to deal with people. When I was talking about that's, that's mentioned a number of times. Whereas Mary Bickerdyke's thing was my way or the highway, 
get it done. Cordelia's was to sit back and size people up and figure out what she needed to do to get them to do what she wanted. And so maybe more of us could keep that in mind. That's something I haven't brought into my own life, but I might be able to, after this, try and use that. But um, those qualities that are timeless of um, looking out for your neighbor is one of the things. Um, if you study her more, you'll find out what kind of a teacher she was, what kind of a sister she was, what kind of a daughter she was, what kind of an aunt she was, um, what kind of a college president's wife she was. Uh, there is a lot to learn, I think, from her life, from her writings, uh, her letters. For the twenty, for the people, and for us in the twenty-first century. Yeah, I, I would have to agree. Uh, truly, a remarkable historical uh, historical character, and uh, you did an amazing job of bringing her to life for us. So, uh, once again, I want to thank Mary Kababic for presenting Mrs. Cordelia Harvey this evening. Uh, a very special thanks to the Illinois Arts Council Agency who has supported this series. I want to thank the Abraham Lincoln National Heritage Area, the Looking for Lincoln Heritage Coalition, and the Kenosha Civil War Museum. So, folks, thank you for joining us, and we will see you next time around. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>